Hello, Pananda. Uh, this is um, uh, the next instalment in the Tech TV webinar series. We're going to be talking with Tavir Tavin, uh, Helen and Jody uh, of uh, Baileys and Partners, who have been uh, one of our most successful pioneer growers stories. Um, uh, Helen and Jody have started a, uh, a, a business in vertical farming where they have uh, um, looked to, to supplying microgreens to local shops and have been incredibly helpful uh, to uh, and really active members of our growers group uh, over the last two years. And uh, today we're going to showcase um, what they've been up to and explain what uh, just how, uh, how they've gone from strength to strength. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Helen and Jody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Molly. Um, I'm Helen and, and this is Jody. Um, we've got a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to be um, giving to you. So you'll just have to bear with me while I just um, screen share and um, get up to speed with that. So if I can just bring things up here. Right, okay. So hopefully, um, just move that over there. Hopefully you can see everything that's, um, I just put that there. Uh, hopefully you'll, you can see, see a screen in front of you which shows our tethered tubbin um, home screen, I suppose, our, our branding. Um, just want to say thank you for joining us today because it's such a lovely sunny day outside and I know um, if you're all um, green fingered and got interest in microgreens and growing anyway you probably prefer to be outside rather than inside on a day like today so thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I want to introduce you to um, Tether Tuthen which in um, English translation is um, translated as a growing small holding. Um, we're based in um, Clambedda, Snowdonian, North Wales. And the small holding comes from the fact that we have previously had pigs, we've got hens, cattle, sheep, um, rabbit, dog, um, pretty much any pet that's um, gone we've, uh, we've had or, or tried and um, or, or had here. Um, we, as I say, we live in Clambedda. Um, we're a bit um, limited on the population. Population here in Llanbedda is approximately 650 people. Um, and the demographic in other areas, we've got Harlech in the north, which is about 1,500 people. Dufferin to the south, about uh, similar. Um, Talabont a bit further on, which is about 650 people. And Barmouth, which is nearing um, probably around 3,000 now. Um, so the, the population around here is um, limited. Um, we've got mountains to the um, east of us and sea to the west of us. Um, topography wise, um, we're at sea level, pretty much at sea level here um, uh, where we are. And we do, being in the Cardigan Bay, we do get a lot of rain. So um, we're fortunate today to have blue skies and uh, not a cloud in the sky, but generally get a lot of a lot of rain. So we do battle a lot with the weather. OK, um, meet your team. Um, primarily Jody, who is sitting to my left here um, and uh, me. Um, and then we're flanked by Ed, uh, who is my husband and my two children, Amelia and Will. Um, who help out a bit as well. Um, uh, we just want to go through with you a bit about how we got started. Um, we were really grateful to have the support of the Tech W team in Mentamon, and we can't thank them enough, really. Luke was our go-to from, from day one. Um, Mentamon supports entrepreneurship and provides support to new business startups. Um, we attended uh, an information evening at Glenclevon College about vertical farming. And um, we were pretty much inspired really by Luke and his setup, his um, homemade vertical farming unit, and then Geraint as well, Geraint Hughes from Madrin Foods, or Lavan, who is um, his other company, talking to us about marketing. 
and we were really interested from from that meeting really to get and start get started with vertical farming and um onto the growing scheme um, we submitted an application virtually the next day and got um, approved our application got approved pretty quickly um so we were very grateful um unfortunately then covid hit so we were delayed um by a year roughly a year for um to start the scheme so our growing really didn't start or our receiving of our unit didn't start until february 2021 um why we wanted to be involved um we saw this as a new and exciting market for north wales um we hadn't heard of it well we'd heard of it before but not around here we knew that um, we could see when we were going out for meals that um, microgreens and um, edible flowers and herbs, uh, micro herbs featured on our on menus for restaurants around here. But we knew that they were purchased from Manchester Market and shipped down here in um, in vans. So we thought that um, we would like to give it a, give it a try to see if we could supply local markets, and we also wanted food security for ourselves and for the local area. Being where we are located, it's very difficult to get fresh, fresh produce. Um, and then by trade, Jody and I are both surveyors, um, land surveyors, um, land agents, it's their course as well. We um we try and do in the office here proof of concept ideas. So we like to invest in things where we um feel that we can add value to our clients. So we have um, solar, we have um, a hydroelectric power scheme, we've got telecommunications mast, we've um, gone into vertical farming, um, uh, we've got the beef and sheep farm, so there's, there's various things and, and leisure as well, leisure interest, so there is various things that we invest in that we can then provide advice to our clients. So this was sort of a sideline for Jodie and I, but we've really enjoyed doing it and expanded the business um, to the extent that we were, you know, we have been provided um, or providing um, local markets with, with produce. Um, as I said, we've got solar panels on the roof of the house, which was one attraction to getting a vertical farming unit, which requires electric, being that certainly on days like this, um, the we had... Um, we could still we had microgreens growing through and they were using the energy of the solar panels for powering the unit okay um so back to basics we thought we'd take we, we know there's various people in this group that are growing already and those are just trying to learn and people that will be watching um the um this video who don't really know what to, where to start and, and what actually vertical farming is so we thought we'd sort of go back to basics and tell you what um, it, it's only our basic interpretation of, of what vertical farming is and what we need to grow, which is what we've learned along the way. Um, so as we'll, we know, plants need water, um, air, um, light and a medium to grow in. Um, the medium doesn't have to be there actually saying that because you can have hydroponics without a medium and they just grow in water solution. But um, so they're, they're pretty much the basics. And then vertical farming is the growing of crops in a vertical arrangement. And you can see in the picture, we have got um, a picture of our vertical farming unit, which is a V farm, um, V farm 522, I think it is. Um, so the method of vertical farming uses the, a medium, which we use cocoa coir for growing our crops in. Um, whereas I've just explained hydroponics uses a solution and doesn't require medium for growing crops in. Okay. Um, so, right, our setup. So we have a V farm flood and drain system. We were pro provided this uh, unit by um, the Tech Tubby scheme. Um, the... Uh, so we received our equipment in February um, 2021. We then um, took a, a couple of months to learn how to grow and had our first sales in April 2023. Um, May. Sorry, May 2021. Uh, May. Yeah, no, we had a oh, 20, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, confusing you. Um, we did some research into actually, sorry, to take a step back. When we were accepted onto the scheme, we did some research into what kind of unit we wanted. Um, there is the flood and drain system, or there is the NFT, the nutrient film technique, 
and um, we decided to go to the flip for the flood and drain system after doing new watching numerous youtube clips and reading articles to see that as um newcomers to the to the vertical farming world that would be the easiest system for us to learn to grow on um so we also did um, market research with our customers and found that the crops that they were wanting to purchase from us being particularly the micro green range we would be best using a flood and drain system to grow those with um my understanding is an, of an nft although i haven't got one or grown in one is that it's more of the leafy green varieties um which we decided uh we hadn't got the market for and that we wouldn't be best growing so um so we opted for the flood and drain um a vertical farming unit okay um the vertical farming unit that we have has five trays as you can see in the picture um so yeah five trays each with um, five, I think it is, uh, T8 LED lights. They've got a water tray um, to hold the water in, which is the drain, which is the flooding system. It's got a, it's got a water pump to pump up to the, to the fifth tray at the top. Um, and then a draining system. It runs on casters, so it's easy to run in and out of our um, unit that we've got in the picture. And uh, this system is really easy to clean, to pull the trays in and out. And we have a, um, a hose pipe to spray down and we clean it out every couple of weeks, every two weeks. Um, the metal frame is um, really easy as well to wipe down. So as a unit goes, it's very easy to maintain and, and use. Um, trays, um, we decided to grow trays in trays, if you like. So the big vertical farming trays that you can see which are grey in colour, we decided to purchase sort of more standardised growing trays like um, seed trays they are, just to be able to put into the larger trays and this helped us to um, maximise our growing space really and maximise the amount of crops that we were, um, uh, that we were uh, uh, be able to produce. supply to people. Okay. Um, substrate or the growing medium we use cocoa coir um we did try matting but we didn't get very good germination rates um we decided pretty early on to stick to what we knew which was the cocoa coir which which provided us with the results that we needed in terms of um yeah the length of time it took for the crop to germinate and and grow and um, we had very little disease as well and pests um, using the cocoa coir. Um, seeds, I was just going to tell you a bit about the types of types that we purchased. Um, we went down the lines of purchasing the, um, again, after market research and what our customers wanted, looking at things like radishes, um, Rambo radish and China rose radish being the most, uh, the most common, um, broccoli, um, some flowers, pea shoots, um, alfalfa. We tried a few kind of um, other things, beetroot, and other bits and pieces, but did, that didn't work so well for us. <laughs> yeah, no, we tried a few herbs. They weren't as well because uh, working as well. I think because we'd we'd gone down the microgreen route and we got the temperature and the um, humidity and the water and things ready for the microgreen route. I don't think it adapted too well to them the herbs that we were trying to to grow. Um, Harvesting equipment, um, we purchased scissors and a kitchen knife, um, a sharp kitchen knife, which we could then sharpen regularly to, to cut with. It was a lengthy process harvesting. And I know that we discussed with the um, Tech Tubby team a mechanical operation to try and harvest trays. And I've seen on YouTube that some people are now actually using harvesting equipment. Um, so it might be something worthwhile for someone to look into if they were going down the, certainly down the commercial route. Um, packaging, we tried, Jodie was in charge of packaging, we tried to be as sustainable as we could be. Um, it was quite difficult to source the right packaging until you'd actually got samples um, to know what you were dealing with, the sizes. Um, it was a bit, a bit of a, a minefield, wasn't it, the packaging? And then uh, we went down the vegware route to start off with and then due to COVID, um, vegware weren't supplying. Um, or they'd run out of stocks. So we were in a bit of a quandary about packaging. We didn't always get it right either. 
So um, I know that um, we sold to an, a fellow grower or gave to a, a fellow grower, sorry, some of our leftover packaging that we that we had. Um, uh, next slide. Um, OK, this is a picture of, of Jodie and I. This is um, one Friday when we were we'd obviously harvested. We've got crops ready and, and packaged. And that shows, the, the, I suppose, the three different stages of our growing at the very bottom level. And um, we've got crops that are just starting with weights on them. And um, so trays with weights on them, weights to help the germination process. And then the top tray shows the different uh, our trays within trays and shows our different types of crops that we were growing. Um, the Rambo radish being the, the nearest on the left. Um, and then you can see the picture with us holding the different types of packaging. Those are both bedware packaging that we used. Um, and the one on the left was our vegware that we sold to restaurants and pubs um, for quanti quantity. And we could get, um, we stocked those with as, as many as we could do. Um, and then we sold those to, directly to the um, to homes as well. And then the um, other one, the see-through packaging on the right-hand side, that was more of a um, retail, um, retail pack that we sold to the shops. Okay, um, so where we purchased our equipment and inputs from, um, as I've said before, the V Farm unit was um, or, or is on loan currently from Tech to um, That um, back in 2021, the cost of that was approximately £5,000. Um, I know the cost of, the, of that has gone up now um i was trying to research yesterday how much they were and i couldn't actually actually see it um don't be put off by that though because you don't need to purchase a unit for five thousand pounds to be able to do any vertical farming um you can buy a set of lights for 15 pounds from from amazon or ebay and and the rest of it can be easily made up with with buying a, a packet of seeds so so you could you can actually start your own growing for probably under 50 pounds or, or certainly under 50 pounds. So don't be put off by the 5,000 pounds figure that I've just stated to you. Um, we have submitted a, an application to be part of the Tech to be Scale Up project um, where we can create and produce our own units. And we're really quite keen to do that. We've really enjoyed learning from the unit that we've got at the moment, but um, it's it, it's not needed is, is what we were, what sort of the message what we were going to, to tell people um, but we're, we're very grateful to have the benefit of being able to learn how to grow on a unit like that. Um, trays we purchased from eBay they were roughly about a pound each and we washed them um, after they've been used just in fairy liquid, warm fairy liquid and then reuse them again. Um, seeds um, we've taken a picture and we've got here the organic black sunflower seeds that were from Sky Sprouts um, we only went to two distributors, I think, that I'm aware of, Sky Sprouts or Premier Seeds. And um, we were very lucky that we haven't had a bad batch of seeds, Tutwood. Um, I know I've heard of reports, um, you know, if you go on Facebook communities and groups that a lot of people have bad batches. We've not been affected by that. Um, we tried to do as much research as we could do into our costings to keep those low as possible. So we'd compare the two different um, suppliers to see what the best price is. We were limited by um, the fact that we only wanted to produce or purchase a relatively small quantity of seed um, compared to other um, growers, distributors. So for that reason, our costs were the seed costs were potentially quite high. Um, uh, substrate we purchased um, the cocoa coir, as I've said, from um, Acorn Horticulture, which are online. They were doing the best at price, as far as I could see, all the way through, and we got a fifty kilo bag for fourteen pounds a bag. Again, um, sorry, that's slightly varied. Sometimes it dropped down to um, 12, 50, 13 pounds, but it was generally about 14 pounds. Um, uh, yeah, it was the best price we could find. And again, we only bought really in small quantities. So the most we buy at one time due to storage as well was, was probably four bags of cocoa coir at a time. Um, 
packaging, vegware, and um, yeah, single use alternatives. They range from 27 pence to 41 pence per unit. So packaging was our one of our main costs. Um, we did investigate going down reusable packaging for um, restaurants and pubs in particular, and for um, direct supply to consumers. That just did not work. We um, the the handing back of clean pots for then for us then to have to wash them again for the processing for people remembering to re return their pots. It it was just um, a, a time. Um, logistical nightmare really so we decided we just have to go down the um, bite the bullet and go down the purchasing of, of packaging although we really resisted it to start off with um labeling we had those already purchased and we just bought those from um, viking direct and we've got a label printer here so that was um easy okay um we wanted to tell you a bit about, um, I suppose, hints and tips really and lessons that we learned from our growing. Um, we, um, uh, just to go through the list really, um, we were provided, when we had our unit, we were provided with um, additive. Um, throughout the whole of our growing process, we've not used any additive for any of our crops. So um, we just use the, um, uh, the seeds, the substrate and the water. Um, we didn't feel any additive was required. And I suppose if, if crops didn't grow and we we left, we we removed them um, and we didn't grow them again. We, 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 or we found different ways to, but we wanted to go down the no additive route. So we, we didn't feel it was required. Um, the, the optimum heat in our unit, um, our growing unit is 21 degrees Celsius. That really worked for us. And the moisture, which I haven't put down on this list, was about 45. That worked for the crops that we were growing. Um, crops like humans require a constant or, or consistent amount of rest. Um, we have solar panels here. So we try to utilize the energy from the solar panels during the day and then turn off the um, equipment, which is on a timer at night. Our crops um, worked well with um, six hours sleep um, uh, or we could make them extend to eight hours. But generally we had about six hours um, over the night when we had no light switched on. OK. Uh, da, 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 da. We used, um, yes, uh, lessons learned, we used black grain trays as, as liners for the larger grain trays. I've, I've explained that previously. Um, that was basically so that we could um, maximize the amount of crops we, we were placing on one tray and um, to be able to move trays up and down as well, up and down the, the unit. So if crops germinate or, or seeds germinate quicker than others, we had the ability to lift a tray, a black tray, onto the next tray up where there was potentially a bit more heat and they'd get a second boost without being at the bottom where it was potentially a bit cooler and they were, were definitely in darkness. Um, if mould appeared, we'd remove the crop immediately. Um, we wouldn't try it to see how it went. We'd, we'd limit or, or um, take away any risk of disease and pests straight away. Um, we've got chickens, so we just gave those to the chickens. So everybody was a winner in that situation. Um, we felt and we needed to for our own, I suppose, sanity and work life balance as well, that we had to establish a routine. Um, so we um, very much did that with our seed soaking, planting, harvesting, um, uh, delivering. And we pretty much dictated to our market when we could deliver for them. So rather than them dictating to us, we were probably, we well, we were in control of that situation or we felt that we were. So, um, and that, that was to do with our um, yeah, work-life balance, really. Um, uh, we found out that um, produce in our area is, is very much seasonal. So we're in a bit of a tourist hotspot here. Um, we've got the mountains and sea to one side, and then um, I suppose larger um, areas of Barmouth and Harlech to the to the south and the north. Um, 
they're, yeah, they're tourist honey pots. So we produced like mad over the summer and there was very much the demand there from um, retail um, outlets and the pubs and restaurants. And then during the winter, we actually stopped growing in November. Um, some of the pubs and restaurants um, shut their doors and um, we had the odd customer, um, household customer that we were supplying to, but we we said to them, oh, it's, it's not really economic at the moment for us to keep the unit growing, which they appreciated. So we started up again in December, ready for the Christmas run as such. Um, we found it was really important to secure orders as much as we could do and grow to those orders. So um, we never had any leftover crops. We gave those away and gave those as samples if we did have any leftover crops. But growing to, to order pretty much meant that we didn't have any wastage. Um, we, on that as well, when I say growing to, to order, we um, ourselves monitored things like bank holidays, holiday seasons, the weather, any local events, and um, we'd potentially put a few extra trays in because of that but we had a system of once it's gone it's gone that worked for us in that I suppose if if you tell people it's gone they almost want more rather than you oversupplying them so it's we found that it's better to say oh, sorry it's only four you wanted five but it's only four today they will alter the next week to say right okay rather than I said I said four would have been nice to have five I'll have six next week so we were um uh growing to order meant that we could say to them sorry we, you only wanted this much we haven't got any more but make sure you order more next week type of thing that that uh, that did work for us um we kept cost setups as low as possible um a previous picture that I showed you had things like blocks as our weights like um normal red red bricks as our weights and we basically sterilized bricks so that we could use them as weights um, rather than buying weights that you can find on um, Amazon or, or, or online at a cost. So we try to keep the costs as low as possible. Um, uh, we maintained quite a number of records. We like record keeping, bookkeeping, spreadsheets anyway in the office environment that we have. So we kept an eye on our costs and our expenses and our income. Um, and then if you're considering growing and not yet started, we would certainly say to you to grow what you know and confident in growing. Um, I, we had six staples that we supplied um, and people knew to come back to us for those staples. If there was any extras that we grew because we were, we were trialing then we put those in as a bonus, but we just made sure that we were really good at growing our six staples. Yeah. Um, marketing and uh, local markets. Um, it's important to establish a good brand. Um, I've just taken a, um, a snapshot of uh, a post that we've done on social media. So we went down, down the Facebook and Instagram route. Um, we did that through Tether, Tether, Tether and then also through um, Baileys and Partners, our, the business here. Um, so it's sort of got two streams really through the two different um, social media outlets. Um, we had the logo, we designed the logo ourselves um, and we tried to make sure that we had social media uh, messages out uh, day, daily, if not every other day. Um, we also asked our customers, so places like the Victoria Inn and Clanbedder, if they could take pictures of their food and send it to us or put it on their social media and tag us in as well. So that worked their advantage and our advantage too. We did the same back to them. Our customers were very good, like uh, you know, very good like that. And they they were quite active on social media as well. Um, imagery is very important. Um, this is one of our first images when when I um, or we went to we went for a picnic up in the woods or barbecue in, up in the woods and um, placed microgreens on our burger and that was a, one of our first images that we had, which was a, a, a complete hit. It just sort of um, I suppose the burger sat there with the fire in the background. It, it does um, epitomise 
the freshness of the burger and the microgreens that you can have and with um, having a wild barbecue out in the, out in the woods. Um, so yeah, important to establish a brand, important for good social media and keeping on top of that. Um, then direct marketing, gone through some of these already, um, delivering to customers' homes, um, grocery stores and shops, um, farmers markets and food events. We didn't have the option of those around here, but in, in larger um, areas, you would have those options. And um, I, I have been reading that as long as you can keep your, your fees down for your um, table at farmers markets, so you can get them sort of 10, 20, 30 pounds, then there is definitely profit to be made there. Some people have been paying in um, larger cities, 60 pounds for a farmer's market table, which has made it un, uh, sort of unviable for them. Um, pubs and restaurants, we supplied to pubs and restaurants. Um, we didn't go down the distributor route because we needed, we hadn't got enough time to grow what they'd want from us. So we thought we'd get the cream of the crop really and grow within a, or deliver within a five mile radius of, or five miles north and south of us, rather than going down the distributor route. Um, uh, and then chefs, again, we didn't do this, but we have had inquiries from chefs um, wanting um, microgreens for catering events, uh, such as weddings. So we didn't supply to them, but again, there'd be a big market out there for that type of, um, for, for larger catering events. Um, and at the bottom we've put here when starting out keep it simple supply a few customers but well um i think that's a message for for anybody with any um you know with anything that they're doing it's really key to to make sure that what you're doing is is little but but do it well um oh i've lost my thing to be able to move oh, on now a little. <laughs> is it gone on now yeah, yeah okay um what can growers do better Jodie and I were brainstorming um the other day about what we felt um as a group um as a um, microgreen growers vertical farming um we could because we're only quite a small community certainly in North Wales that we could do better um we've had massive support from the tech tubby team um we can't thank them enough um the we believe and that collaboration with other growers is key to um to successful growing watching youtube but collaboration in your local area is um priority really um so you know what other people are doing with the markets um i wouldn't say that they're competitors because people like to grow and buy locally so i'd say that if you um, for example, if I'm talking uh, to a, a grower up in Carnarvon, I don't see them as a competitor and I shouldn't do um, because we're too far away um, geographically to, to be a competitor um, because people, because the lo by local sort of ethos, really. Um, uh, sorry, sharing, yeah, collaborate, sharing knowledge and discussing ideas and failures. We feel that that should be um, more out there in the open. Um, we're happy to tell people where things went wrong for us. And hopefully we have provided a bit of an insight here into what has gone wrong and then what has gone right as well, because we also um, need to shout if when things have gone right. And we try to do that through the um, social media messages and images that we produce. Um, we recently have stopped commercially um, uh, growing and selling, and we've referred our customers um, to other growers in the area. Um, we've also had customers that we found in, that came to us on, on, the, on the A55 up in North Wales. We referred those to North Wales growers as well. So if you find customers that um, really want microgreens and they're out of your catchment area, um, definitely refer them to fellow growers. Um, we, um, when we were purchasing our um, cocoa coir, um, or, or our substrate, for example, and um, uh, seeds and trays, we were pur purchasing really in quite low quantities. We feel that it would be really beneficial to the people to bulk buy and share the costs. So, for example, if one if one person if 
if a group of people um, were all growing using um, coca clear, we feel that perhaps one person should be in charge of purchasing a bulk amount of coca clear and then distributing and then the, the other grower should be buying seeds and distributing and then you get economies of scale. Um, there would be say a cost savings to be had if, if that was done. Um, and then the bottom one, keep local food production a priority. Um, we only supplied within five miles um, north and south of, of where we grew. And um, that uh, we did that for time, time reasons, but um, uh, we think emphasis is on local food production and um, and that's what it yeah that's what vertical farm that's what it should be that's what it should um stay as next one um vertical farming the future um at baileys and partners we do as i say as i said before invest in proof of concept ideas um we are we have been putting the message out there of vertical, um, about vertical farming being a bolt on business for a lot of our clients um so we have got um a gentleman who's looking to um, go into vertical farming to add on to his existing egg, egg rounds. He's got um, uh, uh, yeah an egg round and he's looking to supply his, his customers with microgreens as, at the same time. Um, we It's a very desirable um, product. So um, the, the message of um, microgreens is out there a lot more than it was a, a year or two ago. There's massive health benefits and um, uh, uh, yeah, massive health benefits for consumers. And um, there's definitely the support local campaign out there. Um, and plus they look pretty cool on your food as well, as you can see from the pictures that uh, we're just um, showing you now, which are the radish, the uh, red clover and the sunflower, the sunflower with the seed and um, the, the, sun, the, the grown sunflower. Um, you might have heard, but um, uh, there is a national food strategy paper which has just been released and uh, that is supporting really food for the future. Um, it's supporting a prosperous agri-food sector to ensure that we have food security, um, that there is access for foods like microgreens to consumers, um, that we have limited use of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, um, food that you can grow all year round in this country um, and food that can reduce using renewable energy. Um, this, the paper also supports homegrown food as well. And vertical farming ticks all of these boxes. Um, we were, Jodie and I were both commenting that we were watching um, Breakfast News on Sunday and George Eustace was on there talking specifically about vertical farming and about how he felt that it would be... Um, uh, one of the things that would be um, going forward in this country for for um, for growing our crops, and then uh, the yeah benefits for um, the grower. So um, from that we mean that um, Jody and I personally have felt that being part of this scheme and being um, being vertical farming. Users, growers, we benefited massively from um, uh, with health and mental health benefits as well. Um, there's nothing better than having the, the routine of going, checking um, seeds, prospering seeds and um, eating microgreens, um, delivering microgreens to friends and family and seeing their faces when they open a box of delicious healthy, um, color, bright and colourful microgreens. So I suppose our message out there is not really to look at it as, as um, uh, uh, just a business proposition, but more about the benefit, the add-on benefits that it brings to you from a um, yeah, health and mental health benefit um, analysis, really. Okay, um, the future for Tother Tother. Um, we love growing greens. We've been um, very grateful to have been part of this um, project so far and, and the growers group that TechTV has had. Um, we aren't growing commercially at the moment, but what we're 
focusing on is supporting other people who are interested in learning about how to get started and how to grow. Um, we have been in it to, um, we've been discussing growing of microgreens with um, people locally and also been to um, a local school here and supported their growing. And the picture on the screen now is, is sort of an amateur setup of um, a school that we supported. So we provided them with all the um, equip equipment they needed. Um, you can see that dangling down on the picture is the lights, the, um, the panel lights, LED lights that we provided them with. And then we provided them with a manual of how to grow a step-by-step -step manual. Um, we went in and kick-started the, them off. Um, they were super enthusiastic, very, very enthusiastic. <laughs> And then um, we went back on harvest day. Um, we were a bit dubious about whether their microgreens would have, we, we took them sunflowers, whether they would have grown or not. But as you can see from the pictures, they had a very successful um, uh, harvest day. We took a tray in each, uh, three trays in, there was three growing groups. We took three trays in and they had um, microgreens, so many microgreens that we, they could eat them for lunch for the whole school with their burgers and take some home as well. <laughs> so they were very, um, very grateful for the experience. Okay, uh, the final slide, um, just to let you know, we've got time now for, I don't know what time it is, but um, questions and answers, which we're quite happy to go through with you. We're happy to share um, any knowledge that we have, discuss any ideas, any, um, uh, any practical questions or any hints and tips that we can give you. Um, so please ask away if you've got anything. If you want to contact us um, privately, then please do. Our contact details are on the slide that we've given to you. And we'd be more than happy to speak to anybody from whether they're an um, established grower or, or just thinking about starting out. Um, yeah, please get in touch. Okay, thank you ever so much. I'll just um, stop sharing now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a, a really, really interesting uh, um, and really comprehensive presentation. I, I, I was one of the things that really stood out to me was when you said that uh, other growers like a grower in Carnarvon that was hoping to emulate you and do something very similar. Uh, you don't see that as competition. Uh, you know, for you, it's more valuable to get the project and the, the concept of what you're doing uh, elevated to a higher level and to, to, to encourage cooperation. Uh, and maybe, you know, this could lead to other things like collectively bidding for contracts on bigger supply chains yeah. and things. Uh, so yeah, I was really impressed with that. That's uh, such a you know a fantastic story of what you've done and uh, you know really excited to see what the future holds. Um, do we so? Do we have any questions from anyone? Is that you getting ready to ask one, Sheena? Mm -hmm. Hello. Off you go. Oh, Sheena, you, you're on. You're on mute. Sorry. Oh. You're on mute. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Got it. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jenny. Hi. 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 Hello. Nice to see you all. Um, yeah, just a technical question. Did you ever monitor your electricity consumption? Do you know what the um, unit uses? Because I thought maybe you had because you've got your solar coming in. So you might actually have. Yeah. Big... We have. Um... Oh, I haven't, yeah, no, I haven't got the tickets. No, I haven't got the tickets off the top of my head. And oh, no. I, I'll be scrummaging around to. Yeah. We had an um, electric um, monitor that we had all our whole unit plugged into. So we mm -hmm. had everything went through this electric monitor. I think just I've got one. Hold on. Okay. And it helped um, massively to the extent that if, if we thought that everything was turned off, yes, that's exactly what we've got. So everything went through that. Yes. So when we turned, yep. Um, exactly the same as ours. So the unit went through that heater. Um, uh, what else was there? Unit heater. Yeah. We weren't using the majority of the time. We were using two two trays consistently. So we actually weren't using the full kind of unit. I don't think it was ever fully on with all the lights kind of working. Yeah, probably, at the same four, time. probably four probably um, maximum, wasn't it? We had a fan in built into the shed um, design as well. So that was that would have been using some electricity. Electric. But, but we can share that. 
Um, yeah, we'll send that to you. Yeah. Okay. But def definitely, definitely worthwhile. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more so you can actually watch it go up and down, <laughs> yeah. which is quite uh, addictive, really, when you see that the heater just clicks in, just to maintain that 21 degrees Celsius, which whatever yours is at. Mm. You might not need that for your crops, but that's what ours were at. Yeah. 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 Actually, <laughs> I, I did notice you say you only used like the top three shelves. Having grown now for a while, I, I do the first thing I think is, oh, why would you use the the bee farm rack um, for germination? I would, the first thing I yeah. think change I would make in your system would be to take the germination and put it, um, you know, off, off the rack. That would be my... Um, yeah, no, as long as it stays within that temperature, um, we wouldn't want to move it out to anywhere where it wouldn't, because that might grow, that might alter our um, the days, the growing days or the germination days. So we, we'd probably still keep it in. Well, we would keep it in our controlled environment where there's less risks of pests, uh, pests as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it could. It, it doesn't need to be taking up an extra growing tray. We could we could definitely take that them away. I suppose our shed was um, fitted around the actual. Yeah. New actually in terms of the space that we mm. had then, then yeah, yeah a bit we more were. limited but we did stack germination trays on top of each other so we mm. could stack say three um three trays of sunflowers on top of each other and that used that was same weights yeah with the same weights so we only use one weight on three trays of sunflowers for example that were germinating mm. rather than individually weighting them so we just we just stack them yeah 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, how did you find setting up your supply chains and were they easy to manage when you did that? Well, um, yes, they were. I suppose we kicked the social media off quite quickly. And because of that, people came to us. We did go to a couple of our um, restaurants, pubs um, with um, sample boxes and say this is what the type of thing and then after we got them on board we dictated to them what we could supply them really um so you we were in WhatsApp, the... didn't you as your kind of main method of communication yeah. and that worked quite well in terms of keeping a track of records and things yes yeah so we yeah whatsapped all our customers to say what we got on offer this week and how much and they communicated back through whatsapp what they would like to order um or they'd already placed a pre generally placed a pre-order so we'd say to them what we were thinking about growing they place an order and then um we'd we'd firm up saying yes we'll be with you at three o'clock on friday all done through whatsapp which was really easy um, and keeping them we we didn't lose a customer once we got started we gained customers we didn't lose any customers i don't think no we didn't lose any customers more customers came on board that we didn't have um, anybody that we didn't that 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 went okay. Well, <laughs> wonderful, well, great stuff. Um, anyone else have a question? Uh, yeah, I was interested in the um, the question about electricity, which Sheena asked. Um, so that's good. I was just wondering, in terms, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just wondering, in terms of like the space, um, you, you said about a shed there then. Um, I mean, what sort of small space or did you create a, some sort of unit around to sort of reduce the amount of energy needed because it was in a smaller space and was it insulated in some way or something to try and keep that as low as possible? Um, yes, I'll try and find the slide for you, which was um, relevant for this. Yeah, so it, it was a bespoke kind of shed that had insulation um, built into it. So um, yeah. it was sized according to the size of the, the unit that we were getting uh, to give us enough space to work around it, but not that much more that we were having to heat or keep warm. Um, they installed a, a fan into that so that we got the airflow going through the, the building and um, the shed. Uh, it had yeah, the electrical connection, it had a, a light in there, but we were mostly using the lights that were on the, the vertical farming unit. Sorry, this um, this slide must have been skipped through somewhere <laughs> um, about growing successfully. You can see here, um, Ed is we're we're building the unit uh, that um, in our stone shed. We, we're building an insulated unit, 
So I suppose you can see by um, by Ed the size of the unit, which was probably um, how big, um, six foot by, or, or five foot square, six foot, yeah. six foot square. And then it had a um, plinth at the front so that, could, that, so that we could pull the vertical farming unit out for the purposes of washing, cleaning. Um, and uh, our panelling there was insulated. So we did have, um, yeah, insulation filled, the panels were filled in with insulation just so we could ma maintain the temperature and I suppose the moisture as well inside the, uh, inside the unit. Okay. That's great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, did you find any need to heat the, uh, the chamber that it was in during the winter, you know, when you were growing around Christmas time, or was it absolutely fine with just the light, uh, the heat from the lights? So, so we did use a heater, we used an oil kind of based um, thermostatic kind of heater. And, um, and actually probably with once, yeah, maybe when we kind of can tell you what the electric that it used for that, we did have a bit of a debate about it, but um, what the, the heating and using the heater did was allow us to be really very controlled with our growing and, um, and gave us that consistency and that turnaround of, um, of, of the product within kind of the, the you know seven to ten days worth of, of growing um it certainly from, from my perspective and it's one of these things that you you're not wanting to be producing something that is using um a crazy amount of electricity that's coming from a coal-fired um power station so you know it, there's there's an element of what the carbon footprint is of your of what you're growing for your microgreens um but but we debated it and and that's what we used and um, and particularly because we were timing the the energy use um, to coincide with the solar kind of the solar panels. Um, yeah, that's kind of how we yeah we've, we we justified it in our in our own minds and that we could regulate and um, growing a lot more if we had a if we had a heater and we could justify it by having the solar panels. So that's the way that we um, we did it. Um, I'd say that a heater is recommended just for that controlled environment um, side of things. And our optimum temperature was 21 degrees. Um, and we control that through the thermostat. We, we generally didn't touch the thermostat because the unit was um, uh, um, insulated. The temperature, the heater didn't really go on that much, did yeah. it? If we opened the door, the heater came on. Yeah. But it wasn't, we, we tried to lock ourselves in there, again, for pests and things as well, um, making sure nothing came into the unit. Um, but the temperature was pretty constant and the heat didn't, wasn't, wasn't in use that much. Thank you. Any, any more questions? We're happy for anybody to um, contact us um, you know, outside of this presentation as well. Um, to answer any, uh, and we'll answer any questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much. You've always been very, uh, uh, always been very open to to uh, to engage with people and pass on your advice. And uh, you know, because of that, we've had um, so many other. Uh, Really good projects that have benefited from uh, from the work that you've done. Was that you coming in with another question, Sheena? Yes. yes. Ah, there we go. Yes. Right, go on. Um, Fire away. Um, it's just building on this electricity and solar thing. Um, it would just be really good, and I know that um, it's something that you could probably do to to find out um, what is the match between the solar and the consumption. You know, and if you were to recommend this going forward, um, what solar? Um, you know, actually, how much solar do we need to run one rack, three racks, nine racks, um, you know, over over an average year, really, because obviously the sun doesn't shine all the time, we know that. Yes. Um, but, but you know, what is the, the energy balance equation? If you could do some work on that, that would be lovely. Yeah, yeah. No, it would be lovely. <laughs> no, <but laughs> I think... No, we'd be quite, we probably will do that actually. Um, we'd benefit from having um, battery storage for our solar, which we don't have. So that's our limiting factor um, in that, um, yeah, we don't have that. But we can, I can definitely see how much solar, how much um, energy our solar panels have created and um, tell you, um, I don't know the efficiency of them, that's the only thing, but I can tell you how many solar panels we've got, how much energy they've generated and how much our unit 
has um, used. So, uh, well, average use of that. So I, I can sort of share that information. Yeah, because I think if, if we're recommending this as a technology going forward, maybe mm -hmm. we need to look at the bigger package, you know, and, you know, link up with some renewable suppliers as well, get them actually, you know, um, joining, um, joining the, at least understanding um, that they have other functions for their solar panels that they haven't really been marketing. Yes, yeah. No, it would be a bolt on for anybody, um, definitely for for um, anybody with renewable energy to um, for the heating and the, the light, the costs the costs are fairly limited really because the LED bulbs as well they're they're not huge um, energy consumers, you know it's it's then they're not um, you know it's not going to break the bank really for, for the LED lights that there are, but we'll be able to. Yeah, you're obviously thinking differently. You're you're growing uh, a lot, Sheena. <laughs> Well, I don't know, my electricity bills are through the roof, but it's not it's not all about the grow room. I think it's about the teenagers, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, great stuff. Wonderful. Um, well, we've had uh, just over an hour and uh, that's uh, extraordinary high sort of um, quality of content to to ratio of webinar that I've uh, experienced for a long time so thank you um we'll uh we'll be continuing to do this kind of uh, workshop throughout the uh, the coming year uh we've got some more events coming up the next one will be an in-person visit to uh, uh Henbant, um uh, permaculture uh, which is just outside Penagroyce and that will be in July um David do you, do you can remember the date of that I've forgotten off the top of my head uh July the 11th July the 11th um, it's six thirty. That's the one. Yeah. Six thirty or seven. So, so that will be our next uh, visit. Hemband. They've got all sorts of stuff going on there, and uh, it's it's a good example of sort of permaculture, agroecology uh, being integrated successfully in a Welsh uh, Welsh hill farm. Uh, so, uh, if you're interested in coming on that, um, please drop David uh, David a message. Uh, David at Mentermon, uh, or myself, Luke at Mentermon. Uh, fantastic. Um, any other closing remarks or should we, should we draw things to a close? Great. Well, I just want to say a really profound thanks to Helen and Jody. Uh, they've done amazing work with what they've had. Uh, it's a really good uh, example of, of, uh, of everything we, we, we've been wanting to see, rural diversification, uh, a farming business, uh, incorporating new technology to diversify the supply chain, uh, education benefits, uh, understanding how crops work, supply chains, and a bit of renewable energy thrown in. So, you know, really, really good to see all that. Uh, and um, looking forward to seeing how the story unfolds. So, Diakon Barriau, thank you so much, Pau. Um, we'll uh, see some of you at uh, uh, Henband next month. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.